Welcome to our study in the Messianic Psalms, and today we are looking at Psalm 118. This is a conversation, uh, something that Jesus said to his disciples, uh, and very shortly after this, he ascended back into heaven, but it, it, it describes exactly what these Messianic Psalms are. And he said unto them, to his disciples, These are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the Scriptures. Luke 24. Uh, the title of this uh, Messianic Psalm is Messiah, the Chief Cornerstone. Uh, we will find fulfillments of the prophecy of Christ being the chief cornerstone, basically in four different places in the New Testament, and you'll see those references in a minute. Our introduction is we do not know who wrote this psalm, but it, it evidences, it looks like it's David, um, and uh, there's a lot of similarities and phrases that we get, but it doesn't mean that it is him. Chronologically, it fits in at 1 Kings 8.11, so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. This psalm is the last of a series of six psalms uh, that are called, and the Jews uh, even today call them the Hallels. Uh, we would say they are the Hallelujah Psalms. They're psalms of praise and rejoicing, and they were they were recited and sung, and still are today on various Jewish holidays. So these are very important to God's people, and they should be very very important to us. Here's the backstory: uh, the temple has been built, and King Solomon is on the throne. So. Solomon has been responsible. Uh, David could not build it. The Lord told him his son would do that. On this day, the Ark of the Covenant comes home to the new temple. It is a massive celebration, and all Israel is led in worship by Solomon. Here are our verses in verses 22 and 23. Uh, we see and we'll look at these verses when we get that far. And then there's another prophecy of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ in uh, Matthew 21, verse 9. We'll also take a look at that. There's some good things at the end of this chapter. Okay, here's a simple three-point outline. Praise and give thanks for God's mercy. Keep in mind, this is a celebration. Praise and put confidence in God's strength. And then praise and enter boldly with God's blessing. Whether it's boldly enter into the gates with thanksgiving into our heart, or we enter into prayer that we're told to enter boldly, uh, do so with God's blessing and God's desire. This is a big celebration. So uh, the other thing to, before I jump and keep going on from here, uh, the first four verses is just a lot of praise and thanks and for God's mercy, period. Then the middle section, there is praise and confidence in God's strength, but we see the lack of strength, and then we see God's strength appearing, or we see man's failure and acknowledging of that, and we see God's strength coming into that person's life. And then, of course, the last one is, is a wrap-up with all these prophecies. I'm reminded of Hebrews 4.16, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So the very first word already is very emphatic, and it's, oh! And uh, everyone would shout, oh, give thanks, give praise unto the Lord, for he is good, because his mercy endures forever. There are three Hebrew words if you were to research this and type in mercy, and what is the Hebrew word for it, it would be defined goodness, kindness, faithfulness. 
all three of those. And it is that combination of those three that that is in is in the mix of mercy, because mercy is God's goodness. Mercy is God's kindness. Mercy is God's faithfulness to his people. None of those we deserve, but he gives them greatly and abundantly to us. Let Israel now say that his mercy endures forever. Um, if I could read this as the Hebrew would read it, it would say, it would read this, and here's another O oh again. Oh, that Israel may say, his mercy endures forever. Verse 3, let the house of Aaron now say that his mercy endures forever. And let them that not to fear the Lord say his mercy endures forever. Fear means to actually fear God or have reverence for him. And really, it is a word that re requires and that we would understand that it is both. So what's happening in this great celebration, different groups of people are, this, this is a psalm that was sung. And they're either quoting it or they are singing it or different aspects of it. But each people are different. Different people are taking different times to praise God. Here are the ones that fear the Lord, which is probably the congregation. But before that would be uh, the people of Aaron. And that is the priesthood. So the priests would be would be praising God then. All right, let's move on into a rather longer section. But. There's a lot of good information here and a lot of good challenge, but there's a good narrative. I don't want to stop long because I want to read it because it continues to build a picture. I called upon the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. So you see the problem that is mentioned by the psalmist. He says, I was in, I was in straits. Actually, what it means is this, and we, we understand this well. You ever feel, used the, heard the phrase, well, I feel like I'm all cook, uh, cooped up. I'm just like in a corner boxed in, and I just don't know the way out. All right, the psalmist is saying that because look at the second part, and the only, we understand that better, and he set me in a large place. So if we feel we're boxed in and we have no way out and we don't see answers to our problems, then the Lord puts us into a broad room or a, pla a larger place. Let us sort them out. Let us think. Let us look to him for our strength and for answers. The Lord's on my side. I'll not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord takes my part with them that help me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. All right, David's, David, I'm using David, I should say the psalmist, is saying, right, is not saying, I... I know those who hate me, and I'm going to get them, or God's going to get them. And it, it's not saying that right there. He says, I see, uh, therefore shall I see my desire upon them to hate me. That's, he realizes that he wants to get back, but he needs to pull back. And he understands, why, why are they hating him? Are they hating him because he's godly, um, because... He walks with the Lord um, as he said something that's turned them. It is better to trust in the Lord than, than to put confidence in man. And I, I'm happy to pause right now and make this statement to you. Is this, you have just read the exact middle of the Bible. This is the middle verse. If you count up all the verses in the Bible, and divide them in half, uh, you'll come to this one. This is it right there. And isn't it interesting that it says it's better to trust the Lord than to trust man, to put confidence and trust in man. Yeah. And so here's the second one to start the next half. It's better to trust in the Lord than put confidence in princes. How about this? It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in politicians. The princes were the people above them. They were the rulers over them. It's much better to trust the Lord. All nations compass me about, but in the name of the Lord will I destroy them. 
They compass me about. Now we go into this cycle that I, he's surrounded. We've seen compassed. It means he's totally surrounded. He's boxed in. And he needs to understand God's going to get him out of this. Yes, they compass me about, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They compass me about like bees. They are quenched as the fire of thorns, meaning they've suddenly quenched, just put out. For in the name of the Lord, I'll destroy them. Now these, and the the name of the Lord is by the power in the name of the Lord. There is power in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why is it that we, when we pray, we close in prayer in the name of the Lord? It is the power of the Lord that we have the the access to the throne and that we make our requests and prayers are answered. And, and we do know, that this, that's why I said a lot of this is David because we saw David that, that just was chased and had lots of enemies and the Lord took care of them. Maybe Solomon's developed a bunch of them. You have thrust sore at me that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. I was cast down, but the Lord helped me up. I've used my strength. And so I highlighted these in green for you and what I'm going to say. The Lord's my strength, and he's my song, and he's my salvation. If you ever need to do a little devotional, or if you're a pastor, uh, you know how to take a three-point outline and just build on it and make an entire message. But I ran across this and I said, you know what, I'll highlight that because that can teach, that can preach real easy. And then if you say, well, that's really great. Um, all right, I'll give you another one. The voice of rejoicing. Here's three R's. And salvation is in the tabernacles of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. So here's rejoicing. Here is righteousness because we're saved. And here's the right hand, which is the strong hand of the Lord, doing valiantly or working his power in his people. Pretty good preaching there, isn't it? The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. So one point, being so surrounded and encircled and encompassed, he was felt like he was he was in his last minutes of his life, but he knows when he trusts the Lord and he looks to him for strength, he says, I, "I'm not going to die, but I live." And because of that, I will share that as my testimony of the works, the power, the hand of God. The Lord has chastened me, He's instructed me a lot, but he has not given me over to death. So he's keeping me alive for a reason. And today we live and we breathe and we have a new day for a reason. All right, so here's the praise and boldness into God's blessing. Keep in mind, though, that this is not a break in this psalm. So what we read in verse 18, we pick, we just continue on in verse 19. And you can see how it fits in in the outline, but also just in the flow of the psalm. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go into them and I will praise the Lord. Remember he just said before this that he said, I will speak the Lord. I will praise God. Uh, he has been good to me. And so I, uh, the, the, what's happening is in this great celebration that the gates of the city are wide open for everybody to come in. And the gates to up in the temple area and the temple mount are wide open for people to come and to praise God and to worship. I can see the Mount of Olives with people sitting them, looking over the wall of Jerusalem, which they can do easily, and watch all this going on. And the gates of God's, the, the Lord has shown up. And Israel, then as a nation, is in attendance. And righteousness abounds because God is righteous and God is there. This gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter. So we should, we as God's righteous people someday will go to heaven because we have the righteousness of Christ. We've been saved. But no one 
should go into the temple in the temple area unless they are right with God. I'll praise you for you have heard me and have become my salvation. He's not talking about being born again. He's talking about a deliverer or one who has saved him. All right, here come our prophecies and some some interesting things to share with you today. Uh, and then we'll close off the psalm. And actually, we're closing off this study for now. Uh, I, I may revisit some of the, the few that were left uh, way down the road, but they're not in the plans or the works right now. So the stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. The word refused is actually, in the Hebrew, rejected. And of course, this reads uh, just like, that's Jesus Christ. How could we miss this? And the headstone can be translated the chief stone. We're going to read verses in the New Testament that talk about being rejected and the chief stone. And this, this verse is spot on, definitely. It continues because there's, this is more of the prophecy. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Now, I made a comment when I taught this live to our church that I looked up cornerstones. I, I, word, I searched it, and I looked at the pictures. I didn't want to read anything. I wanted to see. And I, and, but I knew what a cornerstone was. It's always on the corner. It's not in the middle. But what would happen is they would make, uh, even back in the, old, in the Old Testament and New Testament, and I made this comment to our people last night that, um, you know, the, the, older, the older civilizations, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Persians, the Medes, the Greeks, the Romans, they built pretty good, didn't they? they, they their buildings are still up. Some of them in, totally, many of them in, in part, but they're being rebuilt with what fell down. And I'm thinking like the aqueducts that the, the Romans built. That was a water interstate throughout the empire. There are still long miles and lengths of these aqueducts, and some of them are still being used. They knew how to build well. That's because they put the cornerstone in first, and it, they, it was well. And then everything thereafter conform to that stone. So what they would do is, in this case, um, the directions from this cornerstone are going to go back or north, and they're going to go left or west. Now, the west is what you're looking at. And in this case, they use bricks. And look how even this came out. Two at the top, five up the side. And they just kept going that way. But in the Bible, they would cut they would bring two more stones to this stone and they would put them where they were going to place them, but they would carve them and sand them and buff them to be exactly like this and they'd set them in. Then the next ones they'd bring, they would do that with the front and the open side of the other and they would do that with every stone from that point on. They wouldn't use a stone that they had made off of the original that was five feet up in the air and say, so well, they just kept doing that. That doesn't work. And that tells us because uh, Jesus is the cornerstone and the church is his building. We don't compare ourselves with anyone else. We compare ourselves to the Lord. That's where we need to match up with. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of people I look up to in the church, and I thank God for them. But they are not my blueprint for my Christian life. They are my help and encouragement for it. Look to Jesus. Here's our prophecies. Here's the four that I put for us to look at. Jesus said unto them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous, awesome in our eyes. Then here's Peter preaching, huge crowd. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head 
of the corner. He is preaching on Jesus, Jesus Christ crucified, buried, and risen, and returned to the Heavenly Father. And he's telling that story, and he's using Old Testament prophecies that he has fulfilled. Great idea, Peter. Here's Paul. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens of the, with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So it's like the apostles and the prophets are the slab, and Christ was that cornerstone that went on that. And the last one in Peter chapter 2, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God, and precious you also, as living stones are built up a spiritual house, and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Now, we're not dead stones. He calls us living ones. We're precious in his sight. We're a holy priesthood, and our job is to praise God and live for him and share the gospel, lead others to Christ, and walk a holy, righteous life before him. This is the day which the Lord has made. We'll rejoice in it and be glad. What's interesting is made means he's fashioned it. Uh, today has been fashioned by the Lord. It doesn't look anything like yesterday, and it will not look like anything tomorrow. tomorrow. God fashions our days for us. Save now, I beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech you, send now prosperity or success. And the word save now in the Hebrew, it should have just said, Hosanna. I, I beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech you, send now success, your prosperity. He's not talking money and prosperity that uh, we get rich because we're Christians. That is not biblical. He's talking about spiritual prosperity. He's talking about to a nation. And it's talking about being success. And being successful is walking and loving the Lord. Blessed be he that comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. And so here is the triumphal entry, of course. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So we have these wonderfully two fulfilled scriptures of our Messiah on a grand scale. Now, uh, we wrap up with some just a quick interesting study that I it bears us sharing with you. And the psalmist continues in verse 27, God is a Lord which has showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even under the horns of the altar. So they are praising, and there's a lot of sacrifices going on on this day. And what would happen, if you would look at the altar, do you see the horns on the four sides sticking up? And so it's talking about a large sacrifice, like a bullock. And what they would do is they would take the bullock up there, and they would have to tie him down using the horns. And then he would be killed and sacrificed. The smaller animals could be managed by hand. Um, but one man, the priest, the high priest, could not handle a bullock. He had to be he had to be tied down. And what would happen is over the course of the years, these these, these horns uh, would have a, get just blood accumulated upon them. They'd be very bloody. And they would be they would be the horns of mercy is what they would be and they they were there for that they were not there necessarily to 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 tie down just the sacrifices so keep that in mind i'm going to go a little further if you went into the holy place of the temple you would find the altar of incense and it's the only other altar or table or furnishing that has horns on it. And look, it has four horns on the altar of incense. Now, nothing nothing died here, but it is a, it is a place of offering. It's a burning of incense, a sweet savor to the Lord. And this is a place that they also found mercy. Now, here's a story of three individuals. 
and I have the privilege of uh, just uh, sharing these stories with you. The first one is Adonijah. It's a brother of Solomon, a son of David. In fact, David's fourth son. Adonijah saw that his dad was on his deathbed. David even admitted it, and his family would spend a lot of time there. But Adonijah, when he wasn't there, he was out among the people, and he was soliciting backing that he, David, would declare him as the next king. His mother was at work doing that also with David, and there was a lot of, he was really planning on it, and he thought he had it. But when Solomon was announced as the king, Adonijah ran to the temple. And I'll back up now. He grabbed hold of one of these horns. And he, these were horns of mercy. And what it was, it was a refuge place. It was a place to go. If you your life was now at stake and you would plead for mercy to the king, Solomon comes out and he sees him there and he knows what he's done. And, and what happens is this. Adonijah is forgiven and given mercy at this time. But shortly thereafter, he is not found. Basically, Solomon said, I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt, and if you don't do anything else behind my back, you're fine. But if you do, I'll kill you. Well, he continued to do, after he got away for a few days, he went back to working behind Solomon to have him killed. And Solomon found out, and he killed him. Now, Joab happened to be one of the generals in David's army, but he was also one of the followers of Adonijah. And so when Adonijah's plot and ploy started falling apart and Adonijah had received mercy, Joab knows he's next. And so he goes running and grabs hold of the horns. But Solomon had the benefit of being raised in the, in the, in the palace and with King David uh, and his father. And so he saw a relationship of Joab and what he really was and the troublesome uh, general he was. He didn't really obey a whole lot. He freelanced too much. And so what happened, Solomon grew up knowing that. And so when Joab ran to the altar, Solomon showed up and had him killed. Okay, now we go a little bit more uh, closer to Christ as we move. We come to the prophet Amos. And the Lord is speaking to him, telling him a prophecy. And he says, to, and Amos writes this, that the Lord has destroyed the four horns of the altar. And let me go back again. And this is what we're looking at. Because of the rebellion and the sin of God's people, the nation of Israel, there was, this was a signal and a sign of this. God was not going to show any more mercy. It didn't happen that day, but what happened is Nebuchadnezzar came to town and ultimately destroyed the city and took the slaves away. That's when Daniel and his three friends went back to Babylon and then tens of thousands as slaves. So that's a little story about the horns of the altar. No wonder the Lord, Paul wrote this. He says, I beseech you, brethren, Christians, by the mercies, the mercy, the horn of mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So the altar that you're looking at, a picture, that's never for us, but it's symbolic. And God wants living sacrifices. God wants us to live for him not offer ourselves as a sacrifice and die on a literal altar. So here we see God's mercy. Today we live in God's, live in God's mercy and grace. And his plan for us is reasonable. You are my God, I'll praise you. You are my God, I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. I want to thank you for listening in. This has been 
a great series for me. I've learned a lot and been blessed a lot. And I thank you for your viewership. And I, let me encourage you to check out my YouTube channel. You're on it now listening. But go to the playlist. You'll see all of the, now you'll see all of the Psalms, the Messianic Psalms that I've done, but lots of book studies and uh, Bible trivia quizzes, archaeological finds and digs will be under Solved and Unsolved Mysteries and another category called Treasure Hunt. Um, and there's Americana that's all about our country. Father, thank you so much for your word, and especially this study. Thank you that we, as Jesus told his disciples, if we search the Old Testament, as we seek the Psalms, Jesus said, we will see Jesus, and we have. But we've seen him also as our Savior because we've had the benefit of history and know that he came. And he died for us and rose again and is at the right hand of God and coming for us. All these promises will be fulfilled, and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.